Uh, thank you very much uh, for a really exciting presentation. And it's generated the tons of questions. Uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, interaction here. Uh, I'm going to try to get in as many questions as possible uh, in sake of time. Maybe we need to divert some of the questions to uh, send them by email later. So uh, first question uh, for Dr. Uh, Manuel. Uh, which um, is more effective uh, in delivering LISA, baractant or proactant alpha, related to the uh, difference in volume? Is there any studies, head-to-head uh, -head comparison? Well, we don't have any, any studies yet, head-to-head uh, -head, uh, comparison, but we, uh, we have been uh, using Baractan um, for many years until this year. And this year we switched to product and alpha and we have exactly very similar results. So probably uh, uh, the efficacy of the two surfactants are very similar. And in terms of the volume, the, this is probably the, the, the main difference when you're applying 200 uh, milligram per body weight, that means uh, 2.7 uh, ml and Berkton is four. So uh, the tolerance is absolutely the same. Um, we are going to probably, um, uh, Publish our uh, comparison between the two surfactants, but uh, I think there are no 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 any no studies, no difference at all. Very good, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, the questions uh, to Kevin is going to all come from me. So uh, I will uh, ask you the first question is about uh, perfluorodecalin. Uh, is it uh, now? Is there any studies to uh, use it as a delivery vehicle? for uh, pharmaceutical uh, agents or genetic therapy to the lung uh, as the same way that you described using it for surfactant. So yeah, I think the perfluorochemical class um, has been investigated in that way um, for sure. The, uh, the del drug delivery has been shown to be successful in the past. Um, one of the senior investigators here at CHOP actually approached Dr. Fox and myself. She's interested in genetic therapy and, and vector delivery to the lung. Um, vector delivery to the lung, as she went on to explain it to me, is very difficult as compared to other organs. Um, the way she described it was the lung is very defensive because it sits, you know, in her opinion, um, is constantly facing our external world, right? It's constantly filtering air from the outside. So it's very good at not letting things in. Um, and so she actually sat with me for about an hour, maybe a year ago. Um, and then um, she has uh, some one of our young surgeons actually uh, was about to start to work with her before um, the pandemic, which really has shut down a lot of our basic research um, as we've kept people away from our campus. So um, I do think that that's an, that's an area that investigators here, not myself, I've sort of help them understand what perfluorooctobromide might bring to them. I think they're interested in, since the, the perfluorooctobromide is twice the density of water, that vector delivery might be improved because vectors would sit at the surface of the lung for longer periods of time. And uh, yeah, I, 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 they're gonna take it forward from here. Great, thank you. Next question to, uh, to Dr. Manuel, uh, at what gestational age, LISA is uh, recommended for? Is there any minimum gestation that you would not use LISA for? Well, uh, this is a very good question, a very important question, because uh, there is no technical problems uh, with any uh, gestational age. But the problem in most of the studies, even for the German group who did the, the, you know, the biggest uh, studies ever, is that those babies, very immature babies, uh, sometimes they fail in terms of that uh, after giving the surfactant by LISA, they need to be intubated. And we are talking about babies around 20, the 23rd and the 24th uh, weeks gestation. Um, again, that's because probably the problem is not related only to the surfactant deficiency, but the global immaturity of the baby. So if we have to uh, focus just on giving surfactant to those very immature babies, then probably uh, we are going to, to fail. So um, in those babies uh, so, so immature, probably uh, surfactant deficiency, again, is not the main, the main problem. And the technique is, is, is easy to do, we do it, but most of them at the end, 
they have to be uh, intubated. But at least you decrease the number of babies who need to be intubated from the very beginning. So you can delay the mechanical ventilation at least two to three days. And this should be very good for prevention of uh, ventilation induced, induced trauma. Very good. Uh, just a follow-up question. Uh, Professor Ramanathan uh, from California uh, presented about a, a week or two ago uh, a meta-analysis about uh, observation in babies who are under 29 weeks who receive uh, non-invasive surfactant and they have an increased uh, incidence of spontaneous GI perforation. Are you concerned at all about these well, that, yeah, that, yeah, that uh, data came from the German group and they found that only in very mature babies around the 23 weeks gestation, we didn't find any perforation in our babies. And we have more than 200 or close to 300 babies given uh, surfactant without any, any uh, complications such as that. Uh, the German group who were the, the only group who described this uh, perforation they probably uh, say that this complication is mostly related to the immaturity of the baby, but not with the technique of uh, giving surfactant. But of course, we are concerned about that. We didn't find any. Um, the only group that really um, found that was the German group. Very good, thank you. Uh, question to Kevin. I know the uh, earlier uh, studies about liquid ventilation were on hold in early 90s because of the uh, complications related to the installation of uh, liquids uh, in terms of uh, lung injury, uh, specifically uh, um, uh, pulmonary bleeding. So uh, is there any new agents right now beside the one that we used in the 90s uh, in terms of uh, less toxic to the lung uh, to you? Not that I'm aware of. The perfluorooctobromide is what we use here during the, the uh, investigation with infants with chronic lung disease. Um, the, the class of perfluorochemicals as a, it's manufactured chemically has some industrial uses. So um, Dr. Fox spent a lot of time, um, years, trying to find someone who could make the perfluorooctobromide, then make it um, medical grade, having it analyzed, and then finding a lab to sterilize it and then package it for the investigation. Um, that was a significant part of the effort. But I don't know of any other, at least we haven't worked with any other perfluorooctobromides or perfluorochemicals. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the issue related to viscosity because uh, uh, perfluorocarbon, uh, uh, there are different uh, family of, uh, of chemicals. Uh, we used perfluorodecalin before, which is really viscous. Uh, in the Turkish uh, group, they used uh, perfluorobron, which is a lot less uh, viscous, so maybe it's less uh, toxic to the lung. The ones that have higher vapor pressures obviously evaporate very quickly. Um, and so uh, different perfluorochemicals have been used in different indications, whether it's artificial sera or artificial oxygen carrying vehicle, artificial blood, if you will. Um, there's a vitreous replacement um, that has been attempted and used. Uh, there's also an imaging agent. Um, the problem with the ones that have high vapor pressures is that they evaporate so quickly with the flow rates on our ventilators that it, the uh, impact is small. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question to Professor Manuel. Uh, the catheter uh, used for LISA, uh, there is a... Uh, um, the Lisa caster, uh, uh, and there's in uh, some people use OG tube, which is a five French OG tube. Is there any difference in technique using uh, either one? Well, the catheter uh, we are using is very similar. This is a, a standard um, a design catheter to give surfactant. It's realized, it's soft, uh, but at the same time, it's easier to use uh, without any kind of forceps. Five French um, again. Um, we have been using this for uh, 2016 without any kind of problem. So the important thing is not the catheter. The important thing is to really do the technique um, quite well, keep the baby uh, breathing spontaneously, um, maintain um, the baby respiratory effort to better distribute the surfactant um, during the installation. 
but the catheter, at least the important thing is to have, you know, enough experience. So use the one you want, but try to, to use uh, one soft and sterilized and around five French is probably the, the size that we are uh, using most of the hospitals. Can I ask one question? Uh, question about your second. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, uh, how are you, Manuel? Uh, I'm Janet. How's everything? Uh, very nice uh, seeing you, but not meeting you <laughs> personally. Same with the cabin. Uh, so my question uh, is that actually we I did also the similar type of talk yesterday. Uh, give an overview, but not uh, that uh, latest details which you uh, just shared. The basic question that uh, if we giving the uh, you know, surfactant by endotracheal tube or by any catheter, in both we are giving the surfactant. So why the LISA is better than insured? What is the physiological basis of that? This is one of the question by the participant also. Yeah, well, um, you know, theoretically, uh, if you use an endotracheal tube, you are going to, um, well, you need to probably um, use PEEP and use your mechanical ventilator at least to, to support uh, expiratory pressure into the lung, number one. Um, number two, the risk of um, uh, intubating the baby and, and leaving the tip of the endotracheal tube in one of the principal bronchi is higher because you are not uh, controlling many times where your endotracheal tube is. Um, using a catheter just uh, one centimeter below the vocal cords it will prevent the distribution um, into only one lung of the surfactant. But the most important thing for me is that in our experience, once, once you have a very mature baby intubated and connected to a ventilator. Many times, and this is uh, our experience, uh, people try to leave the baby connected to the ventilator a little bit more, just because it's a very small baby or a very tiny baby. So in our experience, clearly it was very difficult in the smaller baby to intubate and extubate the baby at the same time. So this philosophy is good enough for bigger babies around or bigger than 28 weeks. But for those, you know, below the 25, 24 or 26 weeks gestation is very difficult in our experience. Those babies were kept on the ventilator longer than uh, the bigger babies. So, and in those babies, we uh, at least uh, leave them breathing spontaneously, non-invasively longer that would ensure it technique. So probably this is the main reason that we prefer the license. Uh, we have a question here about uh, the use of tidal volume with high frequency. There are a few questions that are related. So I'll just try to summarize them in one question. Uh, what is the minimum and maximum uh, tidal volume used for high frequency? And what's the ideal uh, starting point when you just put the baby on high frequency uh, to start with the tidal volume? Uh, as a, a VG, yeah. and in addition to high frequency in a protective strategy. Well, this is a good question. You know, again, what is the ideal? Uh, let me begin with the second. The ideal is the lower as you can. But uh, of course, um, you have to remember that, you know, any baby, any situation, any line condition, any de dead space will need a specific tidal volume. And even more in a single baby along the day, tidal volume will be probably modified because you need to increase or decrease depending on how the baby is doing. So at the beginning, when we began to use this technique, we were choosing 1.5 as a regular starting tidal volume for most of the babies around 1000 grams. And in between 1.5 and 2 for those babies below 2000. Well, uh, at the beginning, we began to use that. And then we, we, we set the frequency around 10. And we look at the DCO2 and the PCO2. We try them to, to keep the baby in the normal PCO2 and then decrease the tidal volume as much as possible and compensate by increasing the frequency. So at the end, you find that those babies that you begin to, to, to use 1.5, probably you move to 1.1, 1.2, and the frequency from 10 to 15 or even 18. So this is the experience. But again, we must remember that uh, tidal volume depends on the dead space. And in babies with 
yeah. even yeah. physiological dead space or very uh, the trauma, a lot of trauma into the lung, you have to probably increase your, your tidal volume because the baby's lung needs a higher tidal volume. So this is important to remember. And in certain uh, ventilators, there are uh, options to do one to two IE ratio or one to one IE ratio, where other uh, ventilators do not allow this. What are your recommendations regarding on the protective strategy in premature baby to use one to one or one to two? Yeah, we, we, we published some studies, some experiments uh, comparing the two I to I to E ratio in the two situations with and without the volume guarantee. So without the volume guarantee, you have to remember that using one to one instead of one to two, you will have a bigger tidal volume. So with this uh, higher tidal volume, you will ventilate more your babies, but the risk of gas trapping is going to be higher. So you have to select. With the volume guarantee modality, doesn't matter one to one or one to two, uh, the tidal volume is going to be fixed. So it's going to be exactly the same. So one to two is, uh, we demonstrated in, in a study that we published uh, one year ago, that is uh, more e uh, efficient to decrease the PCO2 until you reach 15 Hertz. So when you reach 15 Hertz, one to two ratio uh, gives not enough time for the ventilator to, to, to send the fixed uh, tidal volume. So our recommendation is to use during the volume guarantee one uh, to two ratio. And if you go to higher than 15 Hertz, then switch to one to two, one to one to one, excuse me. Very good. We have one question about uh, how to use DCO2 for monitoring PCO2 washout. Uh, is there a certain value that you shoot for, for DCO2? Well, I didn't want to, to go in detail with this, but this is a, a very important question. We have been studying this, this question and we published just uh, a few months ago, and a study that demonstrated that the higher the frequency, the more efficacy is DCO2. So DCO2 is, you have to remember, is a formula that is uh, the result of multiplying square of, del of tidal volume with uh, the frequency. But when you go closer to the resonance frequency of the lung, and this goes around in between 15 and 18 Hertz, then for the same DCO2, the efficacy of uh, washed out PCO2 is much higher. So uh, we demonstrated that and we propose a new formula to correct when you are using frequency higher than 15. So um, what we try to recommend is to look close to your baby and um, try to set the PCO2 and the DCO2, and then try to uh, analyze how the baby is doing. If you want to increase or decrease PCO2, just uh, modify your settings and look at the DCO2. But again, with frequencies higher than 15, we found that the DCO2 is uh, uh, more efficacy than the standard formula. Great, thank you. Question for Kevin. Uh, I know you touched me a little bit about using perfluorocarbons as an imaging modality. Uh, I know Tom Schaefer likes to use the term uh, virtual bronchoscopy with the uh, partial liquid. Uh, is there any experience at top with using perfluorocarbons for imaging? Uh, not formally. Um, I will say that the what set what was the first indication that the infants with chronic lung disease and the severity we treat here as compared to uh, the children with a, a more homogeneous disease that were younger treated initially <clears throat> was that when we started to fill the lung with perfluorochemical, um, just plain x rays showed dramatic differences in distribution um, than previously seen. So I didn't put any of those x-rays in this slide and slide set and I don't have them quickly available. Um, but uh, yes, I think you could imagine using a small amount of this or being able to uh, nebulize it if we get the technology to that point uh, through the will of this institution. Uh, you could absolutely highlight areas along that are regionally ventilated versus not regionally ventilated um, we have had some experiences with the, the study subjects where it became much more clear after 
installation, why certain areas of the lung weren't functioning. Um, and it was consistent with some of our more advanced imaging, looking at uh, ventilation perfusion um, scans, highlighting the same thing. And obviously it's much more simple to do that than to go to get a nuclear medicine study. So um, it was a, a byproduct of the study, um, but it absolutely could be pursued as its own avenue um, if we got the technology to a, an, an easier installation method. Thank you. Hey, well, can I have, yeah, uh, Kevin, uh, can I ask you, uh, what is the future? Uh, I mean, in the near future, uh, this uh, liquid ventilation is coming back or the mean, uh, for example, uh, severe meconium aspiration syndrome. Uh, is it some value of the liquid ventilation as compared to the other uh, normal uh, techniques? I think that my my reading of the early work and talking to some of the investigators who sponsored some of the 90s trials for infants who were closer to term, say the, the infants on um, ECMO, was that for meconium aspiration, it was a bit more challenging, um, the, especially, you know, if you have a lot of meconium in the trachea or the lung causing a ton of inflammation, that the plugging issue from those I've spoken to, Dr. Greenspan, who's one of my friends, yeah. uh, said that that the plugging was a significant problem. Um, again, I think that there's a lot of enthusiasm like there is for aerosolized surfactant to aerosolize PFOB um, yeah. and get much better distribution with less uh, perfluorochemical filling the alveolar space, but the dramatic improvements in oxygenation and ventil uh, ventilation. So I think in that context, if uh, the technique gets refined on the engineering side, then yes, I, I do think um, you have that. I know Dr. Fox has a tremendous amount of enthusiasm because perfluorochemicals of a class have the benefits of lowering surface tension and um, dramatically increasing compliance like you saw in the, uh, the preclinical work slide from, from an earlier generation. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, one question uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Manuel about the issue of uh, surfactant reflux during leisure. Uh, if you if you have a child who you give surfactant by Lisa and there's no improvement after a few hours of giving surfactant, would you uh, at that time give him a second dose of surfactant, uh, assuming that the reflux of the uh, surfactant did not really give him the benefit, or should we uh, abandon the idea and go for intubation? Well, another good, good question. Normally, we in our protocol, we give the second dose of uh, surfactant uh, within the first uh, few hours after the first. If the baby still is needed more than 30% oxygen. Normally, we go up to 40 in the second dose to, to clearly indicate the second, the second dose. And if the baby is needed more than 50% of FIU2 or the baby is having acidosis, then we intubate the baby. But normally, we give uh, a chance with the second dose. Very good. And we give the second dose by Liga? Yes, of course. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Very good. Now, if, if we're using uh, Paracent Alpha, would you use 200 or 100 as the second dose? Always 200. 100 doesn't work at all. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Janine, do you have any questions? Yeah. I think we're doing um, uh, well, but uh, we may be over time a little bit. Yeah, just one question uh, uh, for uh, Sanchez. Uh, just published, uh, I think, uh, in August, uh, the aerosolization uh, trial in American Academy of Pediatric uh, Journal that uh, they have a very good results uh, through in InfaSurf, okay? That they make the aerosolization. So what do you think that uh, it might, uh, in near future, we will get the aerosolized surfactant? for use? Surely, absolutely, yes, okay. no doubt. Okay, okay. Uh, is that, is that's it for me, Evan, it's you for you. Uh, with this, I think we have to conclude this session. Uh, yeah. I would like to thank very much both speakers for really uh, exciting presentations. I'm sure we're gonna generate a lot more questions and if you don't mind, we can just forward them to you and uh, we will uh, ask the uh, uh, participants to submit their uh, questions 
uh, and we will try to um, reply to them, inshallah. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for waking up early. I know it's too early now in the U.S. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go to work but, uh, now. I'm going to go <laughs> see what's out there. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I hope that you have a good day. And uh, we will come back uh, for the, the next session.